Hello, folks, and welcome back to English 437-537 with me, Dr. Matt Barton. In this lecture, we'll be talking about the, uh, I forget what the chapter numbers are, but anyway, the chapter is about blogging in the Carroll book, and then the chapter about consensus in the book by Amy Jo Martin. Now, so here are the learning objectives for today. Hopefully, you'll uh, like these topics. We'll be talking about, I sort of had to <laughs> come up with one for the Martin book, uh, but I was thinking, Putting it this way, understanding active listening, why that's a key strategy for building and benefiting uh, from your social media accounts. Uh, and then we'll jump into the Carol talking about the conventions for writing for blogs, what's common practice, what's what do we know about best practices there. Uh, a little bit about live blogging. You know, it's not something I do myself, but you might find it interesting. And uh, then we'll talk about the... Uh, blog writing in terms of public relations, journalistic context, developing a policy for making corrections and edits and revisions, and then uh, why accuracy and fact-checking are critical <laughs> for, for blogs. Get into that a little bit. I think our uh, author is pretty clear where his uh, politics lie, I think, or his uh, biases lie. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, anyway, uh, let's start with the uh, Martin book as usual. And I was trying to think about how to make a diagram about <laughs> these, uh, what she's telling us about access and connection and relationships. It doesn't quite work out to a nice diagram, but I was able to make a list at least. So access leads to affinity and connection. Okay. And then from there, we have a connection. And then the connection leads to relationships. The relationships lead, you see the follow-up problem. <laughs> relationships lead to affinity. Uh, the affinity leads to influence, and then influence leads to conversions. <laughs> like I say, it's kind of a little bit of a, a mess here in terms of uh, the flow of all this, but I think I can uh, agree with her on these points. Uh, so let's get into this with a question first. Uh, so think about a brand that you care about. I put St. Cloud State University here. Uh, hopefully you care about that, but uh, any brand is fine. Clothing brand, uh, NFL, whatever. Uh, just something you're really passionate about. Uh, so do you feel like you have personal access and a real connection and affinity to the people behind that brand? Do you even know the people behind the brand? And uh, do you feel like they listen to you? Do you feel like they value your feedback? Uh, so just talk about that for about 100 words or so. Uh, just take a little time, think about it, and then come back and we'll move on. So I'm actually kind of uh, intrigued. Now, I want to know what people put for that question because uh, <laughs> I'm just honestly not sure. I was thinking about some of the brands I like. Uh, you know, and you might like a brand, especially if it's a band or something like that, or a team enough to learn about the people. Uh, there's a lot of brands, though, I probably couldn't tell you too much about the, the people behind them. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing your answers. Uh, anyway, Martin uh, talks about NASCAR. You know, this has been in the news. I don't know when you'll be watching this, but it's been in the news lately a lot of uh, because of the uh, Indy or Daytona 500, and there was a bunch of publicity around that. I'll get into the political dimension. Uh, but anyway, just uh, looking at that uh, race, they were talking about it on all the different news stations, and you could really see, I was thinking about Martin as I was looking at that, because uh, you did see this. It's a very... A different sort of environment there at the Daytona 500 than I have seen uh, with other sports where there's pretty big you know it's pretty clear that the if you're there to watch you're not supposed to be interacting with the <laughs> you know the people there the uh, uh, the athletes or the drivers I guess uh, I also noticed this with uh, WWE I've been watching that a little bit and you see there's a lot of interaction when the wrestlers come out uh, there's you know all kinds of high-fiving this sort of thing uh, they'll joke around. I even saw uh, one of the, uh, I don't know, athletes, performers, whatever you want to call them. Uh, there was a guy standing there with a beer. <laughs> and when the wrestler came out, he grabbed the beer the guy was holding and, like, thumped it over his head. Uh, so I don't know quite. Uh, I'm pretty sure that would be an unforgettable moment. I, again, I don't know if it's scripted or not, but it was certainly fun to watch. Uh, but anyway, uh, coming back to this NASCAR, you know, you cert I certainly see this. And I've known people that, you know, we're far from any kind of stereotypes. You know, Martin talks about some of the stereotypes around NASCAR fans, but, you know, I've known some people just like her that went to a NASCAR 
race and came away saying, this was great. You know, this was a really different sort of environment. I really felt like I was welcome there. Felt like uh, <laughs> everybody made me kind of feel the sense of belonging. I got to meet some of the racers. Uh, so that just, re you know, it, they do seem to have this going for them. They are very accessible. And, you know, if you ever do go to one or maybe you've been to a NASCAR race, I'd like to hear if it worked on you or not, or maybe you felt like you didn't have the access. Uh, but anyway, she says this is really key, uh, that the personal access is the entry point for growing any brand. So whether it's NASCAR, a blog, a school, you know, that it's to the point now where people don't want to just wear a logo or see a logo. They don't, they're not really moved by that or a commercial on TV. You know, they want to feel like they're actually there having some kind of human contact uh, they're actually talking to a person who is listening to them, who is seeing them. Uh, so that's, you know, pretty far out if you really think about it. And then she talks more about one of her favorite topics, which is, of course, the uh, personality behind the brand. We don't want these faceless corporations. We don't want just to be marketed to, uh, advertised to. Uh, we want to feel like there's some kind of humans behind that campaign. Uh, and I see this. You know, and all I, I I certainly think she's right. I mean, one of the reasons they, they keep talking about the uh, they'll watch a debate or something like that, and one of the criticisms will be, well, so and so had good answers, but they just seemed scripted. You know, it seemed a little pre seemed a little prepared in advance. Uh, it didn't seem authentic, uh, or uh, you know, it was a little bit too good of an answer. I'm kind of having <laughs> I'm just struggling to articulate this, but uh, I think the idea is they basically have no personality or they're not really, uh, you don't feel like you're watching them. You feel like they're uh, too prepared. Uh, so what I wanted to do was look at some of the St. Cloud businesses and take a look at their social media. Or these aren't St. Cloud. These are just uh, Minnesota-based uh, businesses here. Uh, but I wanted to take a quick look at some of their social media and see if we can see evidence, at least, of a human personality, some effort to try to make their brand seem a little bit more human. So let's see if this will uh, pull up. Okay, that's, yeah, here we go. Uh, so this is, let me see if I can zoom in here a little bit on this. Got way too many tabs open. <laughs> okay, that should do it. So this is a D Duluth Trading Company. You probably know where they are based. <laughs> So it says they're hell bent on creating ingenious workwear for hardworking men and women. So there's their shop. Uh, scroll down here. You know what kind of impressed me about them? I noticed that. Oh, that's kind of fun. They just they must have yeah just a couple of days ago posted this one. Duluth built business wear comfort from under the sea to corner office and all points in between. Uh, but what I noticed when I was scrolling down here a little bit more yeah here we go. Yeah, there's something about President's Day. I think this is the one I was looking at before. Now I'm. Oh, here we go. Yeah, they have all these uh, tweets about people that are doing this construction work or crafting work or artistic work. Here's an artist based in Houston using different uh, mediums to create abstracts and acrylics. So, what kind of stands out to me looking at this? And I'm just seeing all these photos of people. <laughs> You know, there are a lot of just, I guess, sort of ordinary people, artists, uh, who are using the products. It kind of wants to show you uh, these different lifestyles. And then uh, scrolling down here, we had this odd-looking cartoon, kind of quirky. What is this? Must have been around February 4th. Love is in the air, and getting buck naked is on our minds. <laughs> okay. <laughs> kind of weird. Uh, yeah, but anyway, I think there's that guy again. So yeah, I think anybody looking at this would say, yeah, they're, they're kind of quirky. You know, they got some personality. It's not all just bland, uh, you know, boring sorts of marketing, you know, coupons or whatever. They, they put some effort into this. Now let's look at the Coburn's blog. Who knew? Coburn's here in St. Cloud. They got a blog. Now it hasn't been updated in a while. Uh, January 2019, so a little over a year. So I guess they, whoever they had working, maybe they had an intern running their social media for a while. Or maybe they moved on to something else, but 
I'm kind of impressed. They do have a blog and they were keeping it up and you can see again, they're really kind of drawing your attention to here are the people that work at Coburn's and here's their, they're interacting with the community, a police department, uh, some teddy bears. What is this? Coburn's Bake Shop employees recognized by the St. Cloud Fire Department. So there they, they've even posted a video. Here's some more photos of, uh, looks like a, maybe they donated some money. Store directors present checks to area schools through Moore School Rewards Program. All right, so there's quite a nice write-up. A lot of photos, again, lots of photos of people. <laughs> you probably should have cropped some of this, but <laughs> I won't judge. You know what I'm kind of curious about? Oh, there's a lot of these. Uh, let's see if we can find any comments. Probably not. Well, they've got their links there. I guess they've got a Twitter page. Why don't we take a look at their uh, Twitter page quick and see what. Oh, no, that's too tweet. <laughs> okay. Uh, that's just to share it. Uh, so I'm not seeing any place here to, like, make comments. Which usually a blog would have a spot, you know, where you can make comments on it. So anyway, not, I'm not going to spend a, that's kind of cute. I'm not going to spend a long, long time on that, but it looks like they were making some kind of effort. Maybe they should take this course. <laughs> Read Amy Joe Martin's book. I think it would help them. Uh, and here's Golden Plump. So good they're golden. Okay. So uh, this was an interesting one. Uh, so I was reading this, some of their Facebook posts, and here you see there's a, whoever Zach is, well, it says that right there. Hi, I'm Zach, the admin of Golden Plump Facebook account. I'm going to give this recipe a shot at home this weekend. I'll let everyone know how it goes. So apparently that is uh, Zach. You know, we could send him a message. There's got, I guess he posted his recipes. Scroll on down, elevate your ramen. So a little bit of humor. What is this? Cooper is missing. Choose Cooper's adventure. What is that? Okay, sorry. I'm going to have to check this out. In the pantheon of great mascots, he's an afterthought. A forgotten footnote. Where did Cooper go? And will our mascot ever return? Oh, that's funny. Cooper grew up in Wisconsin on the family farm of Names Redacted. <laughs> After his successful debut as the Golden Plump mascot, Cooper, riding high on the fleeting sensation of fame, pursued a series of oddball endeavors. He toured nationally with a famous Minneapolis rock star. He signed with a professional football team but quit when he didn't get enough playing time. He even moonlighted as a rent -a -cop at Mall of America. <laughs> But nothing could quite tame his wandering spirit. And so he vanished, without a trace. But now, after ten long years away, his Golden Plump family wants him to come home. And we need your help. Cooper, don't be afraid. Come home. You know, I couldn't have picked it better. And that is, talk about serendipity. Wow, that just perfectly embodies what we're talking about here. Golden Plump, wow. Huh? Okay, that was uh, unexpected, but really cool. Let me get back to... Let's see how to get rid of that. There we go. It kind of brought a tear to my eye. Poor old uh, Cooper. Uh, so anyway, yeah, I think all three of these, uh, maybe the Coburns, it seemed like they had somebody there for a while. Again, probably an intern uh, who was really, uh, you know, doing, it seemed like they were doing a pretty good job. Uh, but... That didn't last, I suppose. But these other ones are really good examples. I'm really impressed with the Golden Plump. I think they've really gone above and beyond there. They must have some really good people working for them. All right, so here's this. Now it's your turn. You see me do it. So take a look at some of those other brands. I've got a list there. Uh, the top brands in St. Cloud. Top 20 companies, I think. So see, you should be able to at least find a website. Uh, but when you get to that website, scroll around a little bit, see if you can find a social media page, Facebook, Twitter, whatever. Uh, and then ask yourself this. Does it seem like it's got some personality to it? Does it seem authentic? Is it, does it seem human? Uh, or is it just kind of a bland, faceless corporation, corporate speak, market speak, just sort of drab and unimaginative, uh, insipid marketing? You know, what can you find? 
Uh, so check that out, come back, and we'll move on. All right, and then she talks about listening being critical. One of my favorite topics is the active listening. You know, people, so many people assume that you have your, uh, that anybody can listen like that's a real passive thing you're just kind of zoned out now, I've even heard teachers say like you're not really participating unless you're talking in class all the time you know that's there's probably some truth of that but on the other hand uh, you know I think really really focusing and listening carefully is just as uh, I mean you're learning that way I don't think it's anything passive uh, about it uh, but anyway she's talking about this in the context of social media and so it doesn't do you much good if you've got this engagement, if you're asking people questions, doing surveys, and then not actually doing anything with that information. And so she's definitely right there. And she talks about the ignoring the need of the individual. So if you just are always saying, well, that's just that one person's complaining, but that's kind of an outlier. Uh, we can just ignore that. Uh, we, we're not dealing. We, we still have some customers, right? We're the NFL. You know, we're, we can... We don't have to do this. <laughs> we don't have to do the social media stuff. <laughs> and she says, well, at some point that will uh, bottom out. And you know, might not go bankrupt overnight, but you won't see the growth. Or you're missing out on some uh, growth opportunities. Uh, then she says that the uh, uh, this, this one, if you have this relationship with fans, if you can ask them questions, then you can basically figure out if it's worth your while to develop a product uh, before you market it, sell it. Uh, I, I was going to mention with this third item, I see this a lot in game development. It's really huge there because what, what happens is a, a company, instead of just releasing a game, uh, they will uh, go to Kickstarter, this crowdfunding thing, or there's one called Fig, Indiegogo, something like this. So they'll put together a pitch, you know, an idea for a new game, and they'll say, here's the team that's going to work on it. Here's the features the game will have. Here's some screenshots of like an alpha prototype, uh, some interviews and things of that sort. And then they'll say, uh, we, we want to see if we can raise $100,000 or $10,000. Now, this is the thing. They, they know they can't make the game with this $10,000. Know, they need like millions to make this uh, usually, at least a few hundred thousand. Uh, but that's not why they're doing it. Uh, they're not actually trying to fund their game this way. They're just doing this third thing here. They're trying to figure out, you know, is this a good idea? Will people go for this? Uh, will they put their money where their mouth is? You know, that they wanted enough to pledge money to it? Uh, because, you know, anybody might tell you, oh, yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. You know, go for it. <laughs> Write that book. <laughs> Quite a different matter to ask them, well, you know, give me uh, $10 now, and then when the book comes out, you'll get a copy of it. You know, it's sort of like pre-ordering on steroids is kind of how I think about it. Uh, but, you know, you could do something like this. You know, if you blog, if you want to have a T-shirt buttons or something, uh, you could certainly uh, do that. You could market test ideas even. Uh, of course, the problem is, is we'll get into, there's this, this problem with the Twitter communities. All the different social media outlets or the social media platforms, they tend to attract, at least I've noted, this is anecdotal, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but they seem to attract certain kinds of people. Uh, so you want to be careful that you don't mistake, you know, you get this loud response on Twitter, and that doesn't necessarily mean that's the usual response you'll get outside of Twitter. Uh, I think that, the, you know, if you did the same sort of thing on Instagram or Facebook, you might get a very different response just because of what I was saying. I remember, I'm old, I remember Google Circles and Google Plus, <laughs> and it was just bizarre sometimes. You post the same thing on there as you would on Twitter, and it's just like totally different reactions. Uh, but anyway, enough on that. Uh, she talks about the value of social media feedback. I think this is a Simon Cowell, uh, she, uh, the guy from uh, The X Factor. What else did he do? Like Britain's Got Talent? <laughs> Something like that. Uh, but apparently he was one of these types that didn't really want to get into this, didn't really have time for it. But then once he got into it, he sort of jumped in head first. Uh, so he's saying that it's great for the the shows that he's doing, these sort of contests. I don't know, is it reality TV? TV, or whatever that's called. <laughs> I don't watch it. <laughs> uh, but anyway, apparently it's great for him because he can get, like, during the actual broadcast, you know, you'll get this stuff on Twitter, all this different feedback uh, instantaneously. Uh, it will let you make a quick remedies, you know, so maybe even during a show you might decide to do something based on the re response you're getting. 
I said, this is, again, pretty huge thing. You, know, you can imagine before the Internet, before social media, they pretty much the only thing they had to go on was, was those Nielsen ratings. And those are just kind of self-reported. You know, I never quite knew how trustworthy those were anyway. Uh, but you certainly didn't get this kind of instant, detailed, you know, passionate feedback. Uh, so it is a big deal. And the, you know, of course, the question is, what can you learn from it? How can you filter out the noise and get to something that's useful? And this was a nice thought here. Uh, so a lot of times you feel like, well, I probably should have jumped on that. Or you hear about some new thing like TikTok or whatever. I think by the time I mention that, it's probably obsolete. But <laughs> you get the idea. You know, that most of the time you don't want to necessarily just jump and grab the latest thing. I mean, for one thing, it's usually really expensive. Uh, one of the things that's kind of out now uh, that I've been looking into is the, uh, I think I mentioned this, I gave you a link to it. Was it the the, the Cricut and the uh, the Glowforge, <laughs> the 3D printing? <laughs> so, you know, I have certain friends, you probably do too. You know, certain friends that have that already and they're messing with it and they're t talking about, oh, yeah, I printed this little guy and this little thing. And you're like, yeah, that's pretty cool. But, uh, you know, I think I'll just hold on. <laughs> wait for the price to come down. Wait to see if, you know, this is actually just a fad or if it, you know, keeps on. Uh, so you might feel bad about that. But Martin says that you really there could be an advantage to uh, being a little bit late on the adoption. A big one being that you can learn from the successes and the mistakes of those people that sort of went before you. They've made the investment. They've sort of uh, shouldered the risks. Uh, so now you can come along and just, you know, do what worked and not worry about the stuff that failed. And, of course, uh, being a gamer, a game historian, the example that came to my mind was the Ultima Online. It was one of the first, you know, before there was World of Warcraft, before there was EverQuest, uh, there was uh, Ultima Online. And there were some before that, but uh, Ultima Online, it was the first sort of big MMO, and they had all sorts of troubles, just one, you name it, like the people trying to kill each other, uh, the servers going down, uh, cheating, uh, just inflation with their economy, you know, so they, were, they did a lot of stuff, and they learned from their mistakes. Uh, but then uh, Sony and then Blizzard were able to come along and just say, well, here's what was working. Let's take the stuff that worked. Let's improve on that. Uh, and they were able to actually make better games, or at least more successful games, just by taking the stuff that worked, basically learning lessons from the people that came before. So you don't have to make all those same mistakes. Uh, you can <laughs> just go straight to uh, what's working. So there is a, you know, that's a pretty good, uh, pretty good way to look at that. You know, also hear a lot about the in America we built these power lines and the phone, the copper wire. So we had all that in place and then finally figured out we don't really need that. We can just have these wireless networks, uh, the cellular networks. Well, a lot of uh, other countries that couldn't afford to do the copper wire, uh, they're just able to skip that step, you know, and go straight to the wireless, uh, you know, cellular networks. So it kind of worked out well for them. Uh, so they could just sort of leapfrog over that intermediary step and, you know, jump straight into high tech stuff. And there's no reason to go through, you don't have to go through it in a linear progression. So that's pretty cool. Let's see, blogging according to Carol. Okay, so now we're into the Carol book. Uh, he's got a lot of great points in this chapter. Uh, so I want to cover some of this. Uh, one of them is the idea that you don't want to think about blogs in isolation. And I'm trying to encourage that in this course by having you use the uh, other, you know, the Twitter the Twitter, <laughs> using Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, you name it, Tumblr, whatever. I want you to use some of these other social media and social networks to promote the blog. I want you to see the blog is just kind of one component, maybe the big component uh, in, in, a, in the midst of all these other ones. And trying to get away from this idea of just the blog being its own thing, cut off uh, from these other social networks. I think that's a key, uh, key aspect of social networking. Uh, he also talks about Blogs being, uh, he mentions a Rebecca Blood. She was wrote probably one of the first authors to write a couple books about blogging. Uh, she anyway in her book she talked about targeted serendipity, uh, or a shared point of view and information and sources a reader perhaps did not even know they wanted to read. Now, so a lot of the big blogs, whether you're talking about uh, uh, Gama Sutra, they had one called Game Set Watch. 
Uh, what was the other one? Slash Dot was one. I don't. They used to be huge. I don't know if they're so uh, big anymore. But a lot of these. Uh, oh, what was the one? A Boing Boing. It's another one. Uh, so one of the reasons people like going to Boing Boing was you just never quite knew what you were going to see there. You know, you, they had a lot of big variety. I guess they're still around. Big variety of content. Uh, so it's just kind of fun to go there and see, read an article. You might not even have heard of this. You never would have just clicked on it yourself. Uh, but since it's on Boing Boing, you know, it's probably going to be interesting. Uh, so you'd want to read that. You know, and the same thing with Slash Dot. Uh, so I, I agree. That's a big thing about blogs. They sort of bring together this diverse, you know, hunt down all this sort of cool stuff about your topic uh, so that your readers can just go to you to find this out. They don't have to search <laughs> all these weird places. Uh, third, blogging can be understood as an expression of community as well, allowing individuals to communicate and congregate around shared ideas and interests. And so that's what I was saying earlier, why I was kind of surprised the Coburns didn't have any commenting features. Because you think that would be the big draw there. Like it's a local grocery store chain. You'd think it would be like St. Cloud people could talk on there about the sales or <laughs> the recipes or whatever. <laughs> kind of communicate, congregate around that uh, Coburns brand or blog. You know, to me, I don't know why even, why would you even bother if you're not going to have the any kind of commenting on there? because that's really where you start to build, sort of going back to the Martin, you know, it's where you build the affinity, the relationships, the connections, and ultimately the conversions. You know, why would I go to Byerly's? You know, the, look at Coburn's, that's such a great blog, and I'm active on that. <laughs> I'm actually curious now if Byerly's might have a blog. Uh, all right, down to brass tacks then. How do you do this stuff? Uh, here's his top three tips on how to blog, and this comes up a lot. Uh, these, these are definitely effective. Uh, one is to update the thing as much as you can. You know, the, the first thing that stood out to me looking at that Coburn's one was it was uh, over a year old. So that really just says, what's the point of even posting on here? Why would I comment on something? It seemed like it's just been abandoned. Uh, so you don't want that. Until you want to get people sort of uh, used to this regular content, you know, if they if you if you're posting something once a week or once uh, every two weeks or once a month, you know, it gets to the point where they'll just forget about you. You know, if it's like once a year, well, who's going to check that? Or if it's real sporadic, you know, people won't uh, bother with that. Now, so I, I certainly think it's true if you, you know, if you're posting something at least every day, and you know, we'll talk more about that in a minute, uh, it gets people accustomed to that. And it starts to build up, it starts to accumulate uh, faster. Uh, with Matt Chat, I've tried to do that uh, once a week. You know, sometimes I have to miss a week just uh, for <laughs> realities. <laughs> uh, but people come to expect it, right? And it's, it's, you kind of build up this built in uh, audience, uh, guaranteed results that way. If I was just releasing willy nilly, like whenever I felt like it, uh, or took these big breaks all the time, uh, then people would stop checking it. <clears throat> Uh, placing the most recent stuff at the top, uh, this is, I don't know, any blogging software. You, you could probably set it to not do this, but by default, it puts the latest post first. And that's what you want. Uh, use tagging effectively. Yeah, this third one is where most people drop the ball. You know, they'll just post this blog and be done with it, and not even put in the keywords of the tags. But I showed you that in the blogging uh, sort of how-to video. There's a spot in WordPress where you can put in a category. So basically, the more organized you can make your blog, the better, uh, because when people come, they might not want to see everything. You know, they might like that golden plump thing. You know, maybe I just want to see like recipes, and I don't want to see all the other stuff. So it should be easy to click on a keyword or a category term and uh, find that out. And then once you, if you're starting to post on things like YouTube, it's e it's even more critical. You know, most uh, I would say probably something like ninety percent of my uh, viewers on Mad chat, you know, there's a lot of subscribers, but you know, as far as finding new people to watch the show, it's always done through the YouTube search engine. So somebody will go to YouTube and type in like the name of a game or the name of a designer, a game developer, and then my videos will be there somewhere in that list. And the reason for that is, is because I try to use the right tags. You know, I try to think, what would some, you know, what would somebody type in if they were looking for this video? Well, probably the designer's name, maybe the game uh, they worked on. Uh, maybe just something like interview, you know, the, the type of content it is. 
I said, when you get really good at this, you know, you can really see a big difference. Like the uh, the blogs or the videos where you don't post any tags, you know, that, or keywords, uh, they might get, you know, 10% of the views of one where you've really gone in and put a bunch of tags. Uh, so it's really helpful. Of course, you don't want to be misleading with that. Uh, but it helps people to find your content. Uh, he goes on about the good blogging style. Uh, and again, a lot of this is just the same as for good writing in general. You know, the good titles or headlines, uh, layering the content, organizing it into sections, uh, being scannable, good paragraphing. You know, I think paragraphing, I, it should probably be a whole course at St. Cloud State just about this because people just are really struggling with this. You know, I fear that the problem is people have this knee-jerk reaction these days to the good old five-paragraph essay. They say, oh, I don't, oh, I can't do that. You know, that five-paragraph essay is horrible. Like, what are you talking about? You know, it's a great exercise. It, you know, it helps you to think about an introduction, uh, having a body, <laughs> you know, having uh, paragraphs that are about different topics and different topic sentences, and they're focused, and then all builds up into a conclusion uh, that wraps the thing up. You know, I think that's a good structure. I mean, obviously, not everything you write is going to be a five-paragraph essay, uh, but it helps you to visualize, like, what is an introduction? Well, it's going to mention all the stuff. It's going to mention, basically, the topics in those three uh, body paragraphs. And what's the conclusion? Well, it's going to come back to those points, right? So uh, I won't go on with that forever, but, uh, you know, if you're really struggling, like I know a lot of people are, like, I don't know how to do paragraphs. Uh, I'm just kind of writing one big paragraph. <laughs> uh, just, you know, look at look at some of the models of the five paragraph essay. Uh, that could be uh, helpful. Uh, he also says uh, use lists whenever possible. So this is something we do in business writing a lot as well. Uh, so you don't always want to have everything just uh, in paragraph form. A lot of times it is useful to break it out into a bulleted list or an ordered list. Just means numbers. You know, if you're giving features of a product, it's pretty obvious. They even talk about those as being the bullets of the product. Uh, any sort of requirements, supplies, ingredients, you get the idea. And here's the blogging platforms he mentions. I'm not going to worry about WordPress because that's the one we're using. You're already familiar with that, but I thought I'd just quickly show you some of these other options in case uh, you want to look at these at some point. Uh, this one is the blogger.com. I think he said that was Google's product. Seemed like I remember that. But here's a friend of mine named CRPG Addict. And I noticed that he does his, uh, his blog is on uh, Blogger. So you can see he's updated this just a couple days ago. Got his blog there, Realms of Arcania. He's got a picture of the game he's writing about. He's got this list. You know, so really, whether he's read Carol or not, I don't know, but he's certainly following uh, the format, right? He's got his summary there of the game. Screenshots, captions, goes on. Let's see if he's got a... Uh, that's a very long post. Wow. Wow, 60 comments. <laughs> so very engaged uh, audience. Let's see, where's the actual comments, So, Difficulty comments. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so you can see here where he is. Oh, I thought I saw one. Yeah, you can see here where he's coming back and he's, he's answering questions or commenting on what people talk to him about. Jason Dyer, so, you know, this is great. You know, good job. I'm pretty sure his name is Chet or, yes, Chet or, yeah, Chet. <laughs> <laughs> Good job, Chet. <laughs> uh, really active community on this, and look, he's got his patron patron site there, so he's you know making a pretty good living, I bet, uh, doing this. I mean, that's a lot of engagement. And so anyway, that's blogger.com. Let's look at uh, the Tumblr one, and this is one of my developer or designer friends, uh, Josh Sawyer. So he designed, or was a designer on Icewind Dale, Neverwinter Nights 2, Fallout New Vegas, Pillars of Eternity, etc. And so he's using this Tumblr uh, for his blogging. So you can see it looks a little bit different. You know, these, uh, I think uh, Carl said this was more for social, I mean, uh, more for phones. 
tablets and uh, iPhones and things. So yeah, then let's just see if we can look. Is that the whole post? What is this? <laughs> I'm not really. I haven't really played around with Tumblr too much, but yeah, I guess that's the whole. What is this? 18 notes. Okay. Yeah, so definitely you can. I mean, this is just a little bit longer than a tweet, really. Just a little bit about. I guess he's got a question there from somebody. So he's engaging with his audience. And then these notes, I guess that's what they call the comments. So people are liking this, liking this. There's a comment. And there's where he is, uh, the question. In your opinion, would, P would Pillars of Eternity sales benefit from having its next installment be a conclusion to the Watcher's story if it, if it was being developed? Oh, okay, so that's a little snippet. Yeah, so this one, I guess it would take a little while to figure out how to use this. But I can see, I think you can see already the way he's, Josh, uh, is using this to do the stuff that Martin was talking about, right? He's building these relationships, these connections. People are coming here. Uh, they're giving him feedback on these games. And he's uh, talking, chatting about it with them. They will never miss a post, Josh. <laughs> Josh Sawyer. <laughs> Yeah, so good. He's really embodying, he seems to have a good handle on social media. I think uh, you know, I think Carol and Martin would approve. All right, let's do this. Uh, so Carol gives us 10 steps to better blogging. I'll rip through these. Uh, one is to write every day. This is something I've heard over and over again, not just about blogging, but if you're serious about being a writer, whether that's creative writing, academic writing, whatever, uh, you need to do something, some kind of writing every day. Now that sounds horrible for some people, uh, but it's just a habit you develop. You know, I like to, one of the things I like to do is when I wake up, I write uh, down whatever dreams I had. Uh, that night just not any not grammatically correct not edited just I pop my phone open grab my uh, you know there's, there's a notes app on the phone I'll just quickly describe what it was uh, you know obviously you'd want to do a little bit more than that uh, maybe get on uh, you know Google Docs or something and just sort of maybe journal for a while but what you want to do is build into uh, working on a blog uh, something that will be directed not just for your own personal use, but something you can actually publish and work on. Now, let's see. This is the second tip. Schedule your blogging time. Uh, so, again, very common advice to figure out. What you're trying to do here, basically, is establish a habit. You know, if you can get into a habit of, okay, I wake up in the morning, I write uh, 300 words, I write a couple of pages, uh, then eventually that just gets to be so ingrained it doesn't feel like work it's not intimidating it you know you just kind of get up and do it and you know, just like an exercise routine or a cup of coffee you know you just kind of work your way into this and so the key being uh, consistency uh, some people tell me they like to write late at night or at lunchtime or something you know I, I just to me the only thing that's ever worked is early in the morning so if I have an article something I'm working on uh, I like to just get up have my coffee and there's a certain sweet spot where that coffee is just starting to kick in you know you're starting to feel good starting to feel productive you know that's your, sort of your peak time that's when you want to be in, at your keyboard writing away blogging away you know try not to waste that <laughs> precious moments of focus because you know what's the once stuff starts going and you know the emails start coming and the phone starts ringing or whatever it's going to be hard to have that kind of a focus so I would suggest try the early hours. You know, if that doesn't work for you, fine. I, you know. <laughs> Just me personally doesn't. The very idea of trying to write something at, you know, nine or ten o'clock at night or midnight or whatever is just ludicrous. Uh, then he talks about being authentic. Uh, I sort of cut off my image there. <laughs> There's a white or a swan there. Uh, comparing is an act of fear. Choose to be authentic. So what they're talking about there is, again, not trying to sound like a, an advertisement or trying to imitate somebody else. You know, I see this a lot with uh, YouTubers. So they'll watch something like, uh, I remember there used to be this, I guess he's still around, Howard Stern. 
is this kind of real uh, vulgar uh, shock jock kind of guy. And then you get on YouTube and there'd be all these game channels and they'd be trying to, they sound like they're just copying that style. You know, <laughs> like I always thought about like Howard Stern wannabes, you know, you're talking about games. It just didn't, it seemed like very inauthentic. It was very blatant. They just trying to rip somebody off. Didn't come across in any way as just being some authentic view. Uh, so I, I was able to, you know, I just it irritated me. I couldn't stand that. Uh, it wasn't well done. It'd be much better for me if they would just <laughs> not try to be cool or shocking or whatever. You know, just talk about what they like about these games. Uh, you know, not try to ham it up, make it cheesy. You know, I think that would have been a lot more, uh, a lot more enjoyable. So it's something else to think about. You know, if you're always just trying to copy what's popular, uh, you know, why would I listen to some? Why would I want to go see some copycat blog? Uh, when I could just go to the real blog, you know, the person they're copying, I'd rather just look at that. Uh, chances are I probably don't even like that person. Why, you know, if I was satisfied with uh, Stern, I would just listen to Stern, right? Why would I <laughs> be out looking for the, you know, the budget version, the Dollar Tree version of Stern, you know? Uh, so be authentic. Uh, carving out a niche. So I thought this was a pretty good graphic to illustrate this from a... Uh, I don't. I think I broke one of the blogging rules by not writing down the uh, where this image came from. But you can see the uh, how they, you know, in environmental terms, you can kind of avoid competition if you're in the right niche, All right? So some of these birds are kind of up there. This one's just on the land. That one's kind of digging a little bit into the sand and you know on down. And so I've often, you know, this is, was again one of my strategies with Matt Chat, something I had to learn over time. Uh, at first, I thought, well, I'll just do all video games. You know, I was trying to cover like console games, action games, everything. Uh, and the problem was, I was in there competing with people like, well, I'm, I won't even uh, name the names, but you know, all these big time YouTubers that were doing that. And there's just nobody's going to care about, you know, <laughs> Matt Barton uh, just doing a video on the same old video that, you know, that nobody wants another Super Mario Brothers retrospective you know there's like billions of those uh, so you try to find something that's not overdone and so I can still be in the world of games but you know I kind of find like where is the niche you know where's something that there's not already too much content and uh, finally what I settled on was uh, something that coincidentally I liked the most which was these uh, PC the early DOS era uh, computer role-playing games so all the like the Going back to like Apple II, uh, Ultima, all the way through the games like Fallout, uh, Baldur's Gate, you know, Icewind Dell, uh, Might and Magic series, Bard's Tell, you know, this sort of thing. And what was nice about that was, yes, on the one hand, it was a much smaller audience. You know, a lot of gamers never even heard of those games. You know, fine, but you know, if I, <laughs> you know, if I was trying to do that, I'd be competing with everybody. And so, but by finding that niche and kind of settling in there and becoming kind of established there. Uh, now I'm to the point where, you know, I can get on any sort of role-playing game forum or discussion board, whatever, and there'll be people there talking about my videos. You know, I've sort of become, you know, I've sort of found my niche, so to speak. So I would encourage you to do the same thing. And, you know, it might not be obvious. It might not be uh, clear right from the start, but, you know, eventually you'll find out, like, okay, this little area within this bigger topic is something I, you know, it seems to be connecting. I seem to have some connections forming around this uh, so just you know run with that uh, other advice be curious and take lots of notes and I was thinking about my favorite detective here Nancy Drew <laughs> very uh, known for being curious taking uh, being very observant you know this is certainly true when you uh, if you can find interesting things about your artifacts or whatever your topics are stuff that's not commonly known uh, or you're sort of uh, gleaning uh, facts, getting uh, additional perspectives on stuff, and then people will uh, gravitate towards that because uh, they'll see you as being, uh, you know, somebody who's uh, excited and passionate about this topic. And no matter what it is, you know, I was just thinking about this. You know, we were talking about NASCAR before. Like, I'm, I'm just like Martin. I don't really care about NASCAR. But, you know, I've known, I had a friend who was, uh, who was just really into it, really passionate about NASCAR. And there was just some, something about 
anything that somebody's that passionate about, you kind of want to listen. It's kind of interesting. Uh, just through that, you're sort of filtering through that person's personality, I suppose. Uh, but, you know, that's, again, something to think about. Even if you don't care about the topic, uh, if you are, if you do have that curiosity about it, if you do have a lot to say about it, uh, then people might uh, visit your blog. <laughs> Engage. <laughs> oh, I cut off. Uh, <laughs> shouldn't have cut off uh, Picard's hand there. He's doing his, you know, engage. Uh, yeah, so just what we saw with Sawyer, Josh Sawyer, and uh, not so much on the Coburn site, but on those other ones, there's lots of engagement when you get people commenting on your videos. Uh, you should try to uh, engage with them. You don't, I don't, you know, I think you can overdo it. Uh, when I was first starting off on YouTube, it was kind of a big deal. Like, oh, somebody commented on my video. Well, you kind of go nuts and you jump in there and like want to reply right away. <laughs> it kind of makes you seem a little bit, <laughs> uh, I don't know, a little bit too excited, you know. So I'm not quite that on top of it. Uh, but yeah, you know, if you get on there every now and then, make a few uh, replies to at least to people that are asking questions you know if you answer their questions and other people will see that and they'll see the engagement there and they'll say well there's something happening here right so they'll uh, tend to go back to those videos uh, whereas if you just never respond or you have comments turned off or something like that there's just there's people will watch the video maybe but that's it right there's no reason to go back there's no further engagement uh, other advice learning the software so this is a really good tip, you know, that uh, that book, I, the book I like to recommend for creative writers, the uh, James Scott Bell, he's got a book about writing best-selling fiction, but uh, he talked about this, and a lot of game developers talk about this, you know, it's not so important, like, well, are you going to use Unreal Tournament, or are you going to use Unity, maybe you're more of a game, uh, RPG maker, you know, whatever. Or maybe you like Microsoft Word, maybe you like this uh, Scrivener software, or you like WordPress, you like whatever. So it's not so much about just, like, this is the best one. Uh, what really matters is choosing one and then really trying to get to know it well. You know, like getting comfortable with that tool, uh, figuring out what makes it different, what can you do with it. And like WordPress has all these plugins you can get. So that's what I love about WordPress, because about half the time, you're thinking, man, I wish it had this. Well, it probably does have it, <laughs> one of these plugins. <laughs> so you can see here, Google Maps, PS. Uh, so yeah, if you really know how to use that software well, uh, you're you know well on your way. Uh, I remember one of the other books I've looked at about social media talked about getting to know your camera, your phone, like your iPhone or your Android phone. There's a camera, and just you know taking the time to like really figure out how to use that camera well. Uh, how to take a good photo, you know, how to uh, get good lighting results and maybe even getting into like filters and things like that. That's not too hard to do and it can make a huge difference, right? If you if you got a blog with like great photos, great images, uh, that's going to draw people uh, a lot more than just, you know, card or uh, uh, clip art and things of that sort. Let's see, promote yourself. Yes, this is where we all struggle, <laughs> most of us anyway. So yeah, how do you get people to go to the, the blog? You know, I'm always running into people and they're like, well, my concern is privacy. I don't wanna, I don't want anybody to, to see my stuff. I'm like, that's probably not the problem. Uh, the problem is usually, I can't get anybody to click on it. <laughs> you know, I'm like begging, please come look at the video. Please watch my video. Nobody's watching my video, oh no. Uh, it's just bad uh, promotion where, you know, if you're like me, you're taught don't blow your own trumpet. You know, you should be modest. You should be humble. Uh, well, it just doesn't work out too well uh, when you're trying to market something. You have to be able to at least tell people about what you're doing, make it exciting, uh, make people want, you know, take it seriously. You know, I'm not the best at it, so I'm trying to learn along with uh, you all about how to do this. Uh, but one of the things Carol talks about is, and something I want you to experiment with is using some of these other social media tools. Uh, so this is Beth Rekels. Uh, she's a young adult author. Got her website there. But she was using, uh, she's got a, an article I found about Pinterest. And she's talking about how a creative writer can use Pinterest to uh, drum up some views, drum up some uh, engagement. And what was cool about this is that you know you don't normally think about Pinterest as being something for writers, 
know, it's more for uh, photos and arts and crafts and things. But, you know, you can look at that series, and she's, uh, I think, uh, got some great uh, ideas there. <clears throat> Uh, just in terms of formatting, breaking up the text, you know, we talked about this. You don't want the long, huge paragraphs. I mean, it just, just doesn't work. Uh, you know, the same thing with, like, blogs. Nobody wants to sit there and read, like, a 50-page blog post. <clears throat> it just doesn't make any sense. I mean, you, could, you, you, you shouldn't be thinking of, like, a 50-page blog post. You know, if you got that much to say, great, but just break it up into like multiple blog posts, you know, spread out the content a little bit. Think about some, you know, taking out, saving some for later, right? Uh, maybe see what kind of engagement you get and uh, saving some of that energy for the, the comments. You know, there's, there's lots of ways to think about this. But uh, the last thing you want is just to bombard somebody. You know, I get this sometimes. I get these emails, you know, even, the, even in like the business writing class, 332, where I'm like, <laughs> break it up short short emails <laughs> get to the point <laughs> you know even in there sometimes I get like this four pages of like rambling I'm like what is this you know it's like, oh, what? it takes me forever like what do you want <laughs> it's just uh, ludicrous you know and, and outside of uh, somebody paid to read that email who is going to look at it you know once you're if you're doing blogging you know you want people to come and read this basically you got no way to force them to sit there and listen to you just ramble on uh, so you really have to think Okay, uh, let me put myself in the shoes of a reader. <laughs> uh, they probably don't want to just sit there, you know, for 30 minutes working their way through this ungodly paragraph. Uh, so break that sucker up, you know. Uh, you don't need to have the multiple screens of, uh, you know, it doesn't cost you anything to have a section, a subheading, <laughs> a short paragraph, another uh, subheading, you know. Just try to break this up. And here's a, uh, yeah, here's a graphic that shows you sort of the rise in the content that's available these days. I mean, my God, you know, look at this. And this is a conservative estimate of the content production. So you really see from this, I don't know how accurate this is, but <laughs> I like the colors. Uh, but yeah, I feel like this. You know, people talk about back in the day, everybody would watch the same TV show or listen to the same uh, hits on the radio because that's, you know, you had like two stations. Uh, whereas now, you know, you could just, you're sort of absolutely overwhelmed with content. People just aren't going to, you know, give you a chance if you're, if it seems like it's going to require too much of an initial investment. But you got to get them hooked. And once they're hooked, then you can go on for longer. Uh, let's see, be ethical. Yes, be ethical. Okay, we'll leave that there. <laughs> I wanted to show you this quickly. This is a, I don't know if I got her name right. Probably Victoria, might have an extra K. I don't know, maybe it is Vic Victoria. Uh, but anyway, she's got a set of commandments, <clears throat> the seven commandments of ethical blogging. So I like to, I like to look at a blog and see what actual bloggers are saying about ethical blogging. That's pretty cool. And a lot of her advice is very similar to what Curl says. And you know, she talks in here about uh, how to grow your website. You don't want to uh, use these unscrupulous tactics. Let's see what she says there. It means an audience of real people. Uh, it's sad how many people resort to growing their accounts in a dishonest way. Uh, fake news, bought followers, social media bots. Uh, the follow, unfollow method, what is that? A lot of people still disregard these and continue to use less than honest tactics. So you always hear, I remember on YouTube when I was first starting out especially, there was all this, all these people that would come on and say, look, I'll follow your channel if you'll follow my channel. You know, that kind of, uh, or I'll watch your videos if you watch my videos. And there'd be like networks of people doing that. Or people just trying to go to a computer lab maybe and show you know, make every computer <laughs> show their video. Just, and I remember there's a music site that used to be like that. And a lot of, uh, I even had students that would have all these like scams, basically how to drive up their views. And so that's unethical. You don't want to do that. Uh, giving credit where credit is due. Uh, so now I feel guilty I didn't put the links, <laughs> some, of my, some of the photos. Uh, but yeah, if you, people think, well, I don't want to just seem like I'm, relying on somebody else's ideas but 
It's actually a nice way to acknowledge other people. This is why academics, we're always citing each other, you know, because we, we want to, uh, we want them to reciprocate, right? You know, I, found, I found your work useful, so I'm going to make sure to cite you, and maybe people will look at your article too. And then uh, when the shoe is on the other foot, hopefully you'll uh, do the same. See so ads. I think that's about, you know, just making sure that the it's clear what's an advertisement or if somebody's paying you. You know, this has come up lately with some of these uh, folks running for office, right? And they'll just pay pay Twitter users or pay bloggers to write nice things about them. <laughs> uh, and then hopefully they will disclose that and say, well, this is, I was paid to say these things because then you'd probably take it with a grain of salt. Whereas if you were just passing it off as, well, this is how I genuinely feel. Uh, then people found out about that, you would be in a lot of trouble because that would be unethical not to disclose the, that source. All right, those are the 10 tips. So look at that. Which of those tips do you find the most useful? And which ones do you think be the most difficult to follow? You might think it'd be a useful tip, but you know, it's kind of challenging. Uh, so think about that for a while. Okay, let's uh, wrap up here. A few last uh, thoughts. Uh, the blogging in real time. Again, this is something that uh, <clears throat> well, it didn't seem to work. Uh, let's see if I can find that link up here then. Yeah, here we go. Well, that was lucky. So this is what a live blog or live blogging looks like. So I think this was, what is this? The January Democratic debate. So these are people that are watching the debate as it's happening. It looks like there's a good three or four people here. And you can see these blogs, obviously they're not going to be long blogs. You know, they have to, you know, finish the thought so they can continue listening. So they tend to be shorter, like there's just a photo. But you can see this, it's almost like an ongoing sort of commentary. It's actually a pretty interesting technique. I have seen, you know, especially at a computers and writing conference, something like that. Uh, there will be some live bloggers there. Sometimes they use Twitter for this, and sometimes the presenters will even have a screen up somewhere showing these uh, tweets, the live tweeting uh, from people there in the audience. As someone who grew up working class, I love to compare notes with my compatriots. So, you know, these guys don't know what kind of... Oh, that's interesting. But anyway, you get the idea. That's just a live blog. You know, it's, it's blogging about something as it's happening. You know, it's a good way to get attention, uh, obviously, because the people will be tuning in for the debate, and then they might come across this live blogging, and they, they like the, to watch that and bring it up alongside. As they're, like, they're watching the debate, but they could also be looking down at the, you know, at the, at the live blog. So you could think if there's a live event, if your blog is covering sports, you know, you might go to a championship game or whatever. And just, uh, you know, as you're sitting there enjoying the game, also be blogging. Now, blogging journalism to edit or not to edit? So the question here is if you have blogged something, posted it, and then you maybe somebody comments, oh, that was, you got some wrong information here. Uh, what do you do? Uh, do you just go in and delete the post? Uh, do you edit the post to correct the information? And then do you credit the person that corrected you or suggested that needed a recommendation or uh, reviewed it? <laughs> what about just grammar, comma errors and things? You know, where do you draw the line? Uh, and the problem is, it's kind of thinking about is it as a public record. You know, if somebody wants to refer to your blog and they cite it somewhere and then they go back later and it's different content than was there before, it's been edited, uh, that can get really confusing, you know, at the very least. Uh, so what should your uh, policy be? Yeah, that's the question. So what policy do you intend to follow on your blog in terms of editing and revising? So this is something you, if you're doing it by yourself, you know, just come up with something. Uh, but if you have a group, you know, maybe talk with your group and say, we can edit. This is what I would recommend is say, revise the heck out of it before it goes live. And that's why we have that drafting process and the peer review. Uh, but after it's live, you might say, well, we'll just, you know, if there's a typo or something, we'll fix that. Uh, but otherwise, we won't touch it. Or you might say, we'll leave it there and make a new post of corrections. So, you know, it doesn't really, there's not necessarily a wrong way. 
definitively, but just what do you think would be the best policy, given your topic? All right, and then uh, he talks a little bit about how bloggers and journalists fare. You know, what's the difference between a blogger and a journalist? Can you be a blogging journalist? Uh, so some of this is kind of old, old debates. You know, I think it's pretty well uh, established now. You don't, you could be a blogger and be there at the, at a debate or at a, a political conference or whatever. Um, is this? Oh, this slide actually. Maybe I got a little ahead of myself there. Uh, so what they're talking about here is this idea of objectivity. So I think most people these days would probably say that you can't really be purely objective. Uh, no matter how much you say, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to dedicate exactly equal time, you know, to all the different sides in this debate. Uh, it's probably just not possible. Even if you're, it's unconscious, there would be a little bit of a bias there uh, that you will, uh, may or may not be able to spot. You know, if you, if you're savvy in the ways of rhetoric, you might be able to figure out what that, where that bias is. Uh, but anyway, the point is, we're not. It's not enough just to say, "Well, I will be totally objective and not have a political position on anything," or if I do, I won't let that impact my writing. You know, probably not going to happen. There's still going to be some spin there, no matter how hard you try. Uh, and they also say that it's it's easier than ever now. You know, again, considering how many people, I'll show you some Pew Internet research here in a minute. Uh, but, you know, again, we don't just have the two or three news stations. I just was listening to one yesterday, and they were saying that we no, we no longer have a Walter Cronkite. <laughs> you know, so back then, uh, you know, that's where you got your news. You listened to Walter Cronkite, and he gave you the news, and you couldn't just flip over to another channel and get a, a different point of view. Right? It was just all sort of that one thing. Uh, whereas now, if you don't like Walter Cronkite, you know, whatever the equivalent uh you know, if you know if you don't like one reporter, one talk show pundit, whatever, you just flip over. There's a you know a million other ones, uh, or you get on uh, YouTube and find uh, one of these uh, <clears throat> uh, YouTubers. You know, it doesn't have to be somebody with an established uh, uh, company behind them. And so basically, the whether you see this as a problem or a godsend, you know, that's uh, again, <laughs> you know, up to you, but. It's certainly true. I think it's it's easier than ever now just to filter out the stuff you don't like. Uh, you know, just not liking a post or not following stuff on Twitter that you disagree with. It uh, that's the filter bubble. You're just kind of filtering out anything that you disagree with. Uh, or the sort of corollary to that is finding people who do agree with you. It's easy to find, you know, corroborating facts. You know, I, I sometimes do an exercise where I. Say no matter how wacky a conspiracy theory, the, the craziest stuff you can come up with, if you go to Google, in five minutes you can find communities, whole groups of people <laughs> who subscribe to that, and uh, you know, everybody's in harmony on that view, and you can just surround yourself with that and filter out everything that you disagree with, and now you're in a nice, comfy uh, uh, echo chamber. Uh, he talks about fake news, not surprising given his uh, journalism background. Oh, let's see if I can pull up that link there. Yeah, so this is the uh, Pew Research Center, which is one of the few <laughs> of its kind that I think <laughs> is still fairly trusted, you know, by uh, conservatives and liberals. At least I think that's true. We had, maybe there's a Pew Internet research. Maybe there's some Pew research on that topic. Uh, but you can look at some of this, some of these uh, studies they've done. Let's see, large, this is uh, just a few days ago. Wow. Large majority of Americans are concerned made up news could influence the election. So a lot of times it'll be a question like this. So it's just, you know, how do people feel about this? Are they concerned about it? Are they not at all concerned? Just scrolling on down, you can you can see this some of these studies. Yeah, this is a relevant one for our lecture today. Uh, for local news, Americans embrace digital but still want a community connection. So there you go. That's probably something that Carol. Maybe we should send that link to Carol. <laughs> he hasn't seen it already. <laughs> Trusting the news media in the Trump era, Americans are wary of the role social media sites play 
in delivering the news. Social media bots draw public attention and concern. So yeah, you could you could see all this. You know, there's quite a bit of interest in this topic. And I have some students that have worked on that for their thesis, and I've written some, an article on it as well. Uh, you know, it's a big problem, right? Okay, anyway, we have talked about a lot of stuff here, a little over an hour. Uh, so thank you for watching this. Very, very much appreciate your time. Uh, please do ask a question uh, or make a comment uh, about this material, and I will see you next time.